what we covered the last few lectures, there was a lecture on band structure and that was followed by a lecture on direct absorption, absorption from direct transitions and then we talked about absorption from indirect transitions. So today we'll talk about uh, two topics. The first one is we'll talk about excitons and the uh, and I will explain what that is and then the second topic is that uh, we will talk not about absorption but instead we will talk about emission spectroscopies and uh, this lecture is taken almost entirely from chapters four and five in uh, the book by Mark Fox and I've added some uh, original uh, figures uh, from from articles from journal articles uh, to uh, supplement that material. So here's the outline. We'll talk about excitons and what is an exciton and examples and then after we know how to form an exciton, we want to know how do we destroy the exciton, how we can we ionize it and uh, how do excitons behave in, in low dimensional superconductors. And then the second part of the lecture is emission spectroscopies, photoluminescence, electroluminescence, related uh, experimental techniques and then also uh, hot carrier effects and uh, uh, high density effects. That means if you come in with a very intense pulse and create a lot of uh, electron hole pairs, how does that affect the spectra? So this is a figure which I showed you probably about two lectures ago. This is a direct transition in gallium arsenide. And uh, let's look at this uh, absorption process in, in more detail. So here we have a photon coming in and the photon takes an electron which is here in the valence band and the photon removes the electron from the valence band and moves it up into the conduction band. So we are left with an electron hole pair. So there's a missing electron in the valence band and we call that a hole. And instead there is a electron in the conduction band. So that gives us a pair consisting of a hole and an electron. When we draw band structures like this, then these are always single particle band structures. So the, but the electron hole pair, uh, that is a many body system. It's a two body system. It's not a single electron because uh, we have a hole and we have an electron. So this single particle picture ignores the Coulomb force that exists between the electron and the hole. So the electron up here that is, uh, posit that is negatively charged. The electron that was removed here was negatively charged but now we have a missing electron or a hole and in this missing electron picture in this whole picture the whole is a quasi particle with a positive charge. Now the electron that was removed from the valence band that had a wave vector k and the electron which is created in the conduction band has the same wave vector k because we need to uh, conserve energy and crystal momentum. So the electron that was here had wave vector k. The missing electron then has the opposite wave vector. So the whole has a wave vector of minus k. And the total wave vector of the two body system consisting of the electron and the whole. So the electron has wave vector k. The, coal has, the whole has wave vector minus k. So the total momentum of this system consisting of an electron and a hole uh, is, is zero. So if we want to include the Coulomb force between the electron and the hole, then we would use the Bohr model. And I will get to that 
Okay, so we would use the Bohr model to, uh, to describe this system which consists of a hole and an electron and this Bohr model for the uh, exciton is just like the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom instead uh, except that instead of having a positively charged nucleus in the center we now have a hole uh, in the center and the electron uh, circles around this so therefore the exciton which is this whole, elect uh, whole electron system it's more like a positron than like a hydrogen atom because the uh, masses are similar and um, so the electron and the hole they form a bound uh, state with a binding energy and if we just look at the hydrogen atom for a moment then the ground state of the hydrogen atom the ground state of the hydrogen atom is given by the Rydberg energy which is 13.6 electron volts and then the bound the, the binding energy of the nth shell is the 13.6 uh, electron volts divided by the square of the shell number there are two differences between the uh, Bohr model for the hydrogen atom and the Bohr model for the electron and the first difference is that instead of using the masses of the electron in vacuum and the uh, proton mass for the hydrogen atom so instead of having these two masses we need to consider the effective mass of the electron and the effective mass of the hole and then of those two masses we calculate the reduced mass for the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom the nucleus is very heavy and therefore for the hydrogen atom the reduced mass is dominated by the electron mass which is something like 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms but here we need to use the effective masses of the electron and the hole the effective mass of the electron in gallium arsenide is something like 1 20th of the electron mass in vacuum and the whole mass is a little bit larger maybe one half or one tenth of the free electron mass so the mass of the exciton will be significantly smaller like a factor of 10 or a factor of a hundred smaller than the electron mass in vacuum so that's the first difference so when we look at this expression here instead of having uh, the Rydberg energy 13.6 electron volts we have this prefactor the reduced mass which is one tenth or one hundredth of the free electron mass uh, divided by m0 so that's the first difference the second difference is that um, in the hydrogen atom this electron moves around the proton in vacuum there are no other charges around but for the exciton this uh, electron and hole they don't just live in vacuum they live in the crystal and therefore we need to take into account the screening of the Coulomb force between the electron and the hole by the other charges in the crystal and these other charges in the crystal they reduce the Coulomb force and the constant that we need the screening constant is the static dielectric constant and I call that here epsilon sub r and uh, the dielectric constant in a typical semiconductor would be something like 10 or 20 and then that is squared so we're looking at the Rydberg energy which is 13.6 electron volts 
and this is about one tenth, and this is about one tenth squared. So together, that's about uh, one over a thousand. So therefore, the the excitonic binding energy is about one thousandth of the uh, binding energy in the hydrogen atom. So instead of having binding energies in the electron volt range, we have binding energies for this exciton in the milli electron volt uh, magnitude. The radius of the first shell of the um, hydrogen atom is called the Bohr radius and that is 0 0.53 angstroms and then the nth shell is n squared times the first Bohr radius. And this Bohr radius needs to be multiplied for an exciton by the screening and by the inverse of the uh, reduced mass. So this is about a factor of 10 and this is also about a factor of 10. So the exciton radius will be about 100 times larger than the uh, Bohr radius. So we should be looking at um, excitonic radii on the order of uh, 50 angstroms or 100 or 200 angstroms or something like that. So let's look at this picture again. <coughs> We start with an electron in the valence band and then a photon comes in and the photon lifts this electron into the conduction band and now what we have is a hole and an electron and these two attract each other by the Coulomb force and they form this bound state consisting of an electron and a hole in the crystal And um, we just went through the calculation that this bound state has binding energies that are about a thousand times larger than in the, Bohr, than in the hydrogen atom. So the binding energy is on the, is on the order of about four milli electron volts for gallium arsenide. And the radius of this system is about 130 angstroms for gallium arsenide. So the excitonic Bohr radius is much larger than the lattice constant and that is indicated here in this figure. The dots here are supposed to be the atoms and the Bohr radius is much larger than the uh, lattice constant. And the binding energy is milli electron volts so that is a rather small energy if we compare it to KT at room temperature. KT at room temperature is I think on the order of 28 milli electron volts. So we should not believe, we should not assume these excitons to be, uh, uh, to exist at room temperature. So if we go from gallium arsenide to other types of materials then the binding energy will depend on the effective mass and on the dielectric constant. So if we look at other materials like a perovskite, strontium titanate or gallium phosphide or zinc oxide, these are materials with a larger band gap. And because of the larger band gap, the masses will be larger and therefore the excitonic binding energies will also be larger. And um, because the binding energy is larger, the um, excitonic Bohr radius will be smaller. So in the language of excitons or if we talk about semiconductors or insulators in, uh, in general, when people talk about the Bohr radius, they never really mean the Bohr radius of the hydrogen atom because it's not relevant for condensed matter physics. So when people talk about the Bohr radius, they always mean the excitonic Bohr radius which has to be renormalized 
by the effective mass and by the uh, screening constant with the static dielectric constant. Similarly, when people talk about the Rydberg, they don't mean 13.6 electron volts, but they mean the excitonic binding energy. Because of the binding energy, one does not draw a uh, semiconductor picture where we have a valence band and a conduction band. This picture is not relevant anymore. Instead, we really need to look at a picture that looks like this, where we have a hole which is a little bit bound relative to the valence band, and we have an electron which has a negative binding energy. So the electron hole pair sort of sits in the band gap of the, uh, of the semiconductor because of this uh, binding energy. So I've mentioned before that the exciton is stable only when the excitonic binding energy is much larger than the uh, KT. So for gallium arsenide, we have to go to liquid helium temperatures in order to see excitons. And the momentum of the exciton is zero because the electron and the hole have opposite momenta. So the excitonic radius depends on the mass and depends on the dielectric constant. So the excitonic radius can vary by several orders of magnitude depending on the mass and the dielectric constant. So we can have some excitons where the excitonic uh, radius is much, much larger than the lattice constant. And such excitons are called either free excitons or 1Ea mod excitons. And they have binding energies in the range between 1 and 10 milli electron volts. If we have large masses and small dielectric constants, then the radius of this exciton may be comparable to the lattice constant. In this case, the exciton is much more tightly bound. Some people would say it is localized and it has a rather large binding energy between 100 uh, milliEV or even up to one electron volt or even larger than that. So in this case, for the free exciton, you would say, well, this exciton really belongs to the entire crystal because it covers so many atoms. But this Frankel exciton here, the excitonic radius is on the order of a lattice constant. So in this case, the exciton really belongs to only one atom, and we need to take a very different look at the uh, effects that such excitons will have in the crystal. So here are some examples for uh, excitons. We start at the bottom with a semiconductor, indium antimonide, which has a very small band gap of 0 0.2 electron volts. And then we go to gallium antimonide, indium phosphide, gallium arsenide, all the way up to gallium nitride, which has a band gap of 3.5 electron volts, which is almost 20 times larger than the indium antimonide uh, band gap. So we see here that there's a factor of 20 difference in uh, band gap. And if you remember the effective mass and that shouldn't say decrease, the effective mass increases like the band gap. So indium and timonite has a very small, has a very small effective mass. Uh, gallium nitride has an effective mass which is almost 20 times larger than that of indium and timonite. So because of this large difference in um, band gap, we see that there is also a very large increase in the um, excitonic binding energy and a corresponding decrease in the um, Bohr radius. So the binding energy and the Bohr radius depend very strongly on the band gap. 
what we know from the hydrogen atom, what we know from the hydrogen atom is that we have these shells and therefore a hydrogen atom will, dis will absorb light with very discrete uh, energies. And if we look at the absorption of an, of an exciton, then we see that there is this n equal one line which, uh, ha which has a binding energy which is listed here in this table. And then there is an n equal two, n equal three and so forth uh, absorption lines. Now these are very sharp absorption lines just like in the hydrogen atom. But then if you have a hydrogen atom where the electron is sitting in the ground state, so the binding energy is 13.6 electron volts. What happens if this hydrogen atom is hit with a photon which has like let's say 50 electron volts? So what will happen? Ionization. Ionization, exactly. So the, what, what you will get is a free electron which is no longer bound to the proton where it came from and it has an energy of 50 electron volts minus the binding energy. So the same thing can happen here that this is the binding energy, let's say for gallium arsenide, 4.2 milli electron volts. So this is 4.2 milli electron volts. Now you hit it with a much larger energy and therefore you will ionize this uh, exciton. So in addition to, this disc, to these discrete lines that we have, we also get this continuum absorption which comes from the ionization of the excitons. So we have, we have discrete excitonic states and we have the uh, unbound exciton continuum. Two lectures ago we looked at the absorption cross section for a direct transition and we did the math and we showed that the absorption coefficient increases like the square root of the photon energy minus the band gap. In this calculation, we ignored the Coulomb interaction between the electron and the hole. That was a one particle calculation. But what you see here is that the continuum absorption of the exciton is much larger then this dotted line, which is the square root onset of the absorption. At very large photon energies, the Coulomb enhancement no longer makes a difference and the two curves become the same, but right at the band edge, there is this step. And right at the band edge in this region, the exciton absorbs much more strongly than what we calculated in the single particle picture. So the, there's two impacts of the excitonic effects on the absorption coefficient. The first effect that we see is we see this discrete absorption peaks below the band gap. And the second effect that we see is this what's called the Sommerfeld enhancement, which means that the continuum absorption is much stronger for the excitonic absorption than what we calculated in the single particle picture. Here are some examples. Uh, this is gallium arsenide and we look at excitonic effects at different temperatures, 20 Kelvin, 90 Kelvin, 185 Kelvin. Um, you see that there is a redshift of the band gap with increasing temperature. So we should ignore that for the moment because that's not the effect that we're looking for. But what we see is that we have very strong and very sharp excitons at 21 Kelvin. At 185 Kelvin, the exciton is weaker because the exciton is partially ionized. At room temperature, this excitonic peak has, comp uh, the, the 
the discrete exciton peak has completely disappeared at room temperature. So at room temperature, we no longer see an excitonic peak because the exciton has been ionized. Nevertheless, even at room temperature, we still see this strong Sommerfeld enhancement. The dashed line here, that's the absorption that we get from the single particle picture. That's what we would calculate. But what we actually measure are these open circles. So even at room temperature, when the exciton is ionized, we still see a very strong enhancement of the absorption coefficient. So this example is gallium arsenide, and the lowest uh, temperature that we looked at was 21 Kelvin. We see a very strong exciton. What happens if we reduce the temperature even lower, 1.2 Kelvin? Uh, how can I reach a temperature of 1.2 Kelvin experimentally? Um, I need to immerse the sample in liquid helium and then I need to pump on the helium, and pumping on the helium will reduce the temperature below 4.2 Kelvin, uh, and I will reduce the temperature below the point where the helium becomes superfluid. And uh, it's very hard to do experiments at 4 Kelvin because that means that you need to immerse the sample in liquid helium and you it's evaporating, so you have all the bubbles, so you can't really do an experiment at 4 Kelvin. But at 1.2 Kelvin, you, you pump on the helium, the temperature drops below the uh, superfluid transition temperature, and then all of a sudden everything's clear again, and you can do nice experiments. And uh, so these are excitonic effects in gallium arsenide at 1.2 Kelvin with very high resolution, spectral resolution. And we clearly see there's an excitonic peak, discrete peak, n equals 1, n equals 2, and then the uh, n equals 3 exciton. And then, instead, like I said, instead of having this square root like onset, the exciton is, uh, the, the excitonic absorption, the continued absorption is really like a step rather than a square root uh, onset. And um, another example here is uh, zinc oxide taken from uh, Jellison's paper. And uh, zinc oxide is a 2,6 material and it is very polar. And because of the large band gap and the large effective mass, it has very strong uh, excitons. Uh, zinc oxide, unlike gallium arsenide, which has a zinc blend structure, Zinc oxide is uniaxial and it has the wartzite crystal structure and therefore I have to think about what's the absorption coefficient for electric fields parallel and perpendicular to the uh, optical axis and therefore I'm getting two curves here, uh, one for the ordinary and one for the extraordinary dielectric functions. And I see a very strong uh, excitonic peak followed by a, a continuum. So there's, there's no squ uh, square root like onset of the absorption. I have a peak and then I have something that's flat uh, for zinc oxide. So I have very strong excitonic effects in this zinc oxide, even at room temperature. So in gallium arsenide, I have to go to low temperatures, but in zinc oxide, because the exciton is so much stronger, I can see the excitons at uh, room temperature. And the other thing you might note is that there's a satellite here. So there's the, there's the exciton here and there's a satellite, exciton here and there's a satellite in the absorption. And at first you might think, well, these are the uh, n equal 1 and n equal 2 excitons. However, that is not correct. And instead, what we observe here are exciton phonon complexes. So these excitons are very strongly bound to the lattice because they're smaller, so they're more strongly bound to uh, lattice vibrations. And therefore, we see these uh, exciton phonon complexes 
as satellites to the main excitonic peak. So here in gallium arsenide, we can see one, two, three discrete states. I'm not an atomic physicist, so I don't know how many absorption lines you might see in, uh, in hydrogen. You know, how many peaks do you see in the Lyman series of hydrogen, for example. Uh, but if we look at uh, cuprous oxide, we can see 25 phonon, uh, 26, tw we can see 25 uh, exciton peaks. So n equals 1 is forbidden, and I'll explain that in a moment. So here we see the n equal 2, n equal 3, 4, 5, and then if we uh, increase the revolution more and more, we can blow this up more and more, and we can see up to 25 uh, excitons, up to 25 shells. Uh, the wave function for this n equals 25 exciton is uh, very, very uh, complicated because it has so many nodes. Um, these measurements were done using uh, transmission measurements on uh, natural crystals. And uh, in these giant Rydberg excitons, uh, it is possible to um, verify that this formula is indeed correct up to n equals 25. And um, I did in, in the paper, uh, they show this, uh, they show the dependence of the energy on n. So you really see that this equation is uh, well uh, satisfied. So why is this uh, cuprous oxide uh, such a special material? And uh, the reason is that in uh, this oxide, the valence band and the conduction band have the same parity. And because the parity needs to change when you absorb a photon, uh, dipole transitions are forbidden by parity. You cannot have the regular single particle uh, optical absorption in cuprous oxide be because it's forbidden by parity. And when you uh, calculate the absorption coefficients for the excitonic wave functions, then uh, you will find that uh, for P excitons that the um, selection rule is no longer valid and therefore for all P type excitons with L equal 1 uh, you can make such transitions. So the N equal 1 state is forbidden because for N equals 1 I only have L equals 0 and L equal 1 is not allowed so that's why the N equal 1 is forbidden and I can see all the others, and I see them so well because if this was a different type of material, then the continuum absorption would wipe out these um, uh, high Rydberg states. But here in Cuprous oxide, because the, con because the uh, single particle absorption is forbidden, that's why I can see such a large number of excitons. Um, how do we do theory for uh, how can we do uh, how can we how can you how can we do calculations uh, for excitonic absorption and um, if we go back to this Bohr model for the exciton then of course we can treat this quantum mechanically we can write down the Schrodinger equation uh, all we need to do is we need to replace the uh, effective mass and we need to introduce the screening constant but then we have the Schrodinger equation so we can calculate the wave functions the quantum mechanical wave functions for the hydrogen atom and they will also be valid for the Bohr model so a quantum mechanical treatment is easy and any kind of calculations are no, no harder than um, doing calculations for the hydrogen atom so that's why we can do this, uh, this calculation here for the um, excitons in copper oxide. I showed you this table earlier where I said that 
excitonic effects are weak in indium and timonite and they get stronger as the band gap gets larger. So let's compare here indium and timonite and germanium. Indium and timonite has a band gap of 0.2 electron volts. Germanium is about four or five times larger. And at the highest temperatures, this is the uh, absorption coefficient versus photon energy at various temperatures. And shown here in red is the uh, absorption just above room temperature. And you see that, well, this almost looks like a square root, right? So in indium and timonite, the excitonic enhancement, the Sommerfeld enhancement is almost lost at room temperature and only at uh, 77 Kelvin. Here we see this step followed by a square root-like um, behavior for the absorption in indium and timonite. In germanium, and unfortunately this is not the same temperature range as in indium and timonite, but you see in, in germanium there's a very strong onset. There's even some peaks in the absorption uh, coefficient at uh, the lowest temperature. And even here at 718 Kelvin, even at the highest temperatures that we could reach, we never have the square root-like onset that we have in indium and timonite at room temperature. So here with this picture, we see that the Sommerfeld enhancement is much stronger in materials like germanium where the band gap is larger than in indium and timonite. So excitonic effects are stronger in materials with large band gaps. That's the point of this slide. So we've talked about the uh, Sommerfeld enhancement on a couple of occasions, uh, but how do we actually treat this mathematically? So we have the discrete absorption and we have the um, Sommerfeld enhancement of the um, single particle um, absorption. And like I said, we can use the wave functions of the exciton from the Bohr model to calculate the absorption coefficient. And um, we get this sum, which is a delta function of all the uh, discrete excitons and the intensity of the discrete peaks decreases with a factor of n cubed and the other parameters which are here in this expression there's the uh, k dot p matrix element p there's the effective mass and there's the um, screening constant so here we ca this is the result that we get if we calculate the discrete absorption and then similarly, we can calculate the continuum absorption. And the first fraction is the same result as shown here by this dotted line, where we have the square root-like onset of the absorption, ignoring excitonic effects. If we include excitonic effects, then we get this enhancement, which is given by this second term, where this parameter psi, that's the ratio of the um, excitonic Rydberg energy divided by the excess energy of the photon where the band gap has been subtracted. So if psi goes to infinity, then this term goes to one and the Sommerfeld enhancement, uh, I'm sorry, if, if the energy becomes very large, then psi goes to zero and if psi goes to zero, then this uh, expression uh, goes to one. So the Sommerfeld enhancement disappears for very large photon energies. But if the uh, exciting energy is very close to the band gap, then this val value of psi is very large and then we have a very large uh, Sommerfeld enhancement which is shown here by this solid line relative to the dotted line without the enhancement. Uh, in these formulas, there is no broadening parameter 
In reality, uh, we need to include broadening and uh, that was discussed in a number of articles by Toyo Sawa and we'll see later how the broadening will change what we observe. So uh, these formulas come, uh, these formulas were derived by Elliot in 1957 and they were only valid for the imaginary part. So now if we want to, um, if we want to measure this with ellipsometry, then we're interested not only in the uh, imaginary part, we also want to know what is the real part. So in order to get the real part, we need to do the Kramers chronic transform. Unfortunately, that was never done. Uh, two very bad things happened to Elliot. The first one is he was promoted and he became an administrator. And the second one, he was knighted by the uh, British Queen. So he never had the time to do the Kramers chronic transform. So for 30 years or 40 years, nobody got around to do this until 1995, there's Christian Tanguy and he just wrote down the uh, Kramers chronic integral for these equations and he did the math. And um, here we have an expression due to Tanguy which includes the excitonic bound states and the continuum. And um, this expression in, uh, includes a digamma function. So this is uh, gamma is the, the gamma function and if you know about the theory of complex uh, functions then you'll know what it looks like. I should have uh, included a picture here in my slide. I apologize but it has, you know, this has many, many divergences. And then we take the uh, logarithmic derivative of this. So that's the digamma function. And then uh, this term here, 1 over psi, we already know what psi is. This term here, this is the regular single particle uh, electron hole absorption. And then most of the Sommerfeld enhancement is in this term here, the natural log of psi. And uh, so this is the uh, complete uh, dielectric function. Uh, for the, which describes the real and imaginary part of the excitonic effects to the um, dielectric function. And uh, in case anyone wonders, um, uh, this expression is built into the Willem software, so you never have to calculate your own digamma functions. This is all, if you use the right software package, then this is all already built in. So here is an example. We already know that the regular square root um, electron hole single particle absorption coefficient is enhanced by the uh, Sommerfeld enhancement. So instead of having a square root like onset, we have the step like onset. So this is the imaginary part. But now with Tanguy's uh, Kramer's chronic transform, we can also calculate the real part. So what we see is that there's not only an enhancement in the imaginary part of the dielectric function, there's also an enhancement in the real part. There is an excitonic peak in the real part as well as in the imaginary part. Um, the band gap is here at zero, so the band gap was chosen to be 1.42 electron volts, just like for gallium arsenide, the Rydberg energy is 4 milliEV and the broadening was chosen at, as 6 milli electron volts. And because we have this broadening, we do not see any discrete excitons. They are wiped out by the broadening parameter. So, what we see here is that the peak in epsilon 1 is uh, significantly below the band gap. So this is 0 and the peak in epsilon 1 is below the band gap. So by looking at the peak in epsilon 1, 
uh, we can uh, determine the excitonic binding energy. So not only the imaginary part, also the real part is enhanced. So we see a, an excitonic contribution to the refractive index below the band gap. Um, so my student measured germanium at 10 Kelvin. And the uh, imaginary part is shown in blue. And the real part of epsilon near the band gap is shown in red. That's at 10 Kelvin. And then um, Jose Menendez did a calculation based on uh, this expression here. And we find a very, very good agreement between the Tangui theory and the measured uh, real and imaginary part of the uh, dielectric function. And most of the parameters that go into this are fixed because the effective mass for germanium is known very well. And the excitonic binding energy of germanium is also known very well because it can be calculated from the dielectric constant and from the effective masses. So the only thing that we need to have as parameters is the band gap itself is a parameter. And then we have this linear background in the real part, which comes from the E1 critical point, uh, the broadening parameter is a free parameter. And then we have this amplitude A. We have this amplitude A, which in principle uh, should be given by the k.p matrix element. But the k.p matrix element is only known for up to about 10 or 20 percent. So we allow this also to be treated as a parameter. So with a very small number of parameters, we can um, very well describe the uh, dielectric function of germanium with these excitonic effects. You might say the agreement is not good uh, below the band gap, but this is an experimental artifact. Ellipsometry cannot measure small absorption coefficients. So the errors here are larger than the uh, discrepancy between the data and the theory. So after we've looked at excitons, and I've given you examples of several excitons, we want to ask, well, how can I ionize the exciton? How can I destroy the excitonic effects? I've already mentioned that uh, in materials like germanium or gallium arsenide, the uh, excitonic binding energy is very small. In gallium arsenide, it was 4.2 electron volts. In uh, germanium, the excitonic binding energy is only 1.7 electron volts. Uh, so at room temperature, we don't expect to see excitonic peaks. Um, we expect that at a temperature of 20 Kelvin, the excitonic enhancement should disappear. And we sort of see that as we increase the temperature at 10 Kelvin, we still have a very strong exciton. But then if we go to 50 or 100 Kelvin, then the um, excitonic peaks, the discrete peaks, uh, disappear. So uh, one way to ionize the exciton to drive the electron hole pair apart is by increasing the temperature above this critical temperature, which is equal to the excitonic binding energy divided by the uh, Boltzmann constant. Another way to do this is by applying an electric field. So the potential energy of an electric dipole is equal to the dipole moment multiplied by the electric field. And the dipole moment of an exciton is sort of like the diameter of the exciton multiplied by the um, electronic charge. So we would expect that if the energy of the dipole in the electric field is on the order of the uh, excitonic Rydberg, then um, the electric field should be strong enough to separate the electron hole pair. So what we find here is a critical field 
which is equal to the binding energy divided by the diameter of the exciton and the um, electronic charge. So we get a critical field on the order of 60 kilovolt per meter. And um, here in this image, the uh, dashed line shows the absorption coefficient uh, for a field of 500 uh, kilovolt per meters. And the solid line shows the zero field absorption coefficient. And what we see is that we have a very strong excitonic peak in the zero field case for gallium arsenide at 5 Kelvin. But then if we apply this um, electric, if we apply a high electric field, then the excitonic peak disappears or it gets at least, it is much broader, but some of the excitonic enhancement uh, still remains. So an electric field can also ionize an exciton. Uh, here it says photocurrent because a photocurrent spectroscopy is one way to measure absorption coefficients because you have this PIN diode and the photon is coming in and but you've applied a voltage uh, so you measure the current you measure the current through this diode and in the if the uh, if no if the photons are not absorbed then there is no current but if the photons are absorbed, then you see a current. So this photocurrent is proportional to the absorption coefficient. That's why the curves look like this. So high electric fields can ionize electrons. And uh, the third method of ionizing the electrons is uh, using very high densities of uh, charge carriers. So if the density of photoexcited excitons is very small, then the excitons will be very far apart. So the diameter of this exciton is on the order of, let's say, 100 angstroms. And if the mean separation is, say, 1,000 angstroms, then the separation between the excitons is much larger than their radius and therefore the excitons will not see each other. And therefore there is no uh, interaction between them. But let's look at the other extreme. So what if the distance between the excitons is about the same as the diameter of an exciton? So that means that the excitons will touch each other and therefore, we need to take into account the uh, energy uh, and the interaction between, the, uh, between several excitons. So we see that this separation parameter, the distance between the excitons, is a very important parameter. And this separation is typically described by the... Um, by this quantity Rs. So if we know the density of electron hole pairs, then we assume that the electron, uh, that the exciton is a sphere. So the square, the, the cube root of the uh, volume of the sphere, that gives us the uh, separation, that gives us the distance between the excitons as a function of the carrier density. And then we calculate this parameter Rs which is equal to the distance between the excitons divided by the excitonic radius. So a transition, a phase transition occurs when we go from this excitonic gas where the excitons are far apart to what one might call an electron hole liquid where instead of looking at individual excitons, we really need to look at correlated electron hole pairs. So this transition occurs when Rs is on the order of one. So for gallium arsenide, uh, that's on the order of 10 to the 17 per cubic centimeter. So uh, this is not even a very high 
uh, density of electron hole pairs for gallium arsenide. So what happens as we increase the density as we re, uh, reduce this parameter Rs. So first, what will happen is instead of having single excitons, we can also have bi-excitons and tri-excitons or multi-electron uh, uh, complexes. So you can imagine um, if an exciton is a hydrogen atom, then a bi-exciton, that will be two hydrogen atoms, so that will be a, an, an excitonic molecule, so that will be like a hydrogen molecule. And of course, uh, it's not just that the electron is bound uh, by the Rydberg energy inside a hydrogen atom. If we bring two hydrogen atoms together, then we create a new bound state with a new molecular binding energy which is less than the uh, Rydberg energy, but still there is an additional binding energy. So these bi-excitons are bound even more than a single exciton. And then um, as we, so at first, as we approach the mod transition, we see bi-excitons, tri-excitons, et cetera. If we increase the density even more, then uh, we get electron hole droplets and uh, we call them droplets. If we take a bulk germanium crystal and we increase the, the, the uh, or a gallium arsenide crystal, and if we increase the carrier density to uh, such a high level where we see electron hole liquids, then the entire crystal would become unstable. So we can only create an electron hole liquid in a very, very small volume and that's why we call them droplets rather than uh, a big ocean or, where, or lake where the entire crystal would disappear. And the way one does this is that one takes a germanium crystal and one applies a screw and then in that, cr that screw creates a, an inhomogeneous strain field and the uh, potential energy depends on the strain. So wherever the uh, strain field from that, from that screw is the uh, largest that there will be a minimum in the potential energy and that's where you will see this electron hole droplet. And something else that can occur is, um, you know, the electron is a fermion and the hole is a fermion, but the exciton is a boson. So if we have many, many excitons together, then we can have this Bose-Einstein uh, condensation, but uh, I don't think that I have an example for that uh, here in my slides. So, uh, how can we uh, model these effects uh, quantitatively? So the first thing I remember, we have this parameter Rs, which is the separation between the excitons uh, relative to the excitonic Bohr radius. So to include these effects, we need to, uh, the, because of these many body effects, there will be additional screening. So in the Bohr model, we need to replace the uh, Coulomb potential. In the hydrogen atom, we need to replace this with the Yukawa potential, which is the uh, screened um, Coulomb potential. So K, that's just the uh, E squared over four pi epsilon zero, but then we have the um, screening constant epsilon R. And which screening constant to take here, that's a very complicated problem for many body physicists. There's different forms of screening. The, the, the subscript D here is for the bi. There's also Thomas Fermi screening. There's dynamic screening and static screening. So this is the simplest possible case that we just treat the screening with a single parameter, which is equal to the static dielectric constant. The screening length, the screening length is given by this uh, lambda d by, by this d by length. And um, 
I took this formula from the book by Z on, on semiconductor devices, and of course device physicists uh, need to deal with this, but basically we have the screening constant multiplied by KT divided by the uh, charge carrier density. So if the density is zero, then the screening length is very large, and the screening length becomes smaller as the carrier density increases. And there's also a temperature dependence. So the Yukawa potential um, is the same as the Coulomb potential, except that we have this additional uh, screening constant, uh, uh, the exponential of minus r over the Debye length. Uh, there is a problem with the Yukawa potential that the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom with the Yukawa potential is not solvable. So we cannot write down the wave functions. We cannot do any calculations. So instead what one does is one replaces the Yukawa potential with this Hulthane potential. And the Hulthane potential, the, the, the equation looks even more complicated but it turns out that for the Hulthane potential, the uh, Schrodinger equation is solvable, at least for the 1s state. And uh, therefore, we can uh, determine the binding energies for this Hulthane uh, exciton. And uh, when we look at this Hulthane potential, we have this parameter G, and G is equal to the uh, Debye length to the uh, excitonic Bohr radius. And uh, in the unscreened case, if the uh, density is very low, then G is equal to infinity if the interaction is fully screened, if all the excitonic effects are turned off and we only look at uh, single particle um, absorption, then G is equal to zero. And then uh, the mod transition occurs when this parameter G is equal to one. So the uh, dielectric function for the Hulthane potential was also um, solved by Tangui in 1990. A few years before that, there was a, a highly cited paper by Banyai and Koch where they calculated um, at least the imaginary part which then Tangui uh, Fourier transformed. And there's also a book by, I wanna say Haug and Koch, I forgot it, on um, many body effects, quantum theory of, of, uh, of exit, of, uh, absorption of optical properties, including many body effects. So with this Hulthane potential, we can calculate what the um, excitonic absorption looks like. So again, we have uh, bound states and we have continuum states. And all the terms in red, those are the new terms that were introduced by the density and we see that there's no longer an infinite number of uh, discrete absorption states for the exciton. Instead, there is a finite number. This n squared needs to be less than g. If g becomes small enough, then there are no bound states at all. And then also in the exciton continuum, uh, we have uh, this factor G, which is uh, modifying the excitonic absorption. And using these, um, the solution, using the wave functions from this Hulthane potential, uh, Tangui was able to calculate the dielectric function for the screened case where we have this parameter G. So when you see that in some equations, then you'll know where that G comes from. It comes from the high density effects. So
here are some examples. And uh, this is, uh, let's say, gallium arsenide, the uh, real and imaginary part of the dielectric function of gallium arsenide um, for, as a function of the density of the electrons for two different broadening parameters. Here we have a small broadening parameter and on the right we have a large broadening parameter. And let's talk about the imaginary part first. If G equals infinite, if G is infinite, then the density of excitons is very small and we get the usual uh, enhancement of the um, absorption uh, with the, uh, there is a very strong discrete exciton. If screening starts, if this G is equal to 1.5, then the excitonic binding energy decreases. So the, the excitonic binding energy decreases and also the um, oscillator strength of this discrete exciton increases. If G becomes larger, let's look at the dotted line, then the excitonic peak has disappeared, but there is still this step-like onset of the absorption. Um, so we still have the Sommerfeld enhancement, but we've lost the exciton continuum and then the last curve here at the bottom with the double dot dash, uh, that is the fully screened case where we have turned off all the excitonic effects and we have recovered the um, electron hole absorption. So that's for the small broadening case. This is if the broadening is larger. If the broadening is large, we never have an excitonic discrete peak to begin with, but we still have the, um, we have the step-like onset of the um, absorption coefficient uh, due to the Sommerfeld enhancement and the Sommerfeld enhancement decreases as G goes to zero and here we have only the uh, single particle absorption coefficient. So that's the imaginary part, but even if there is no peak in the imaginary part because of the large broadening, in the imaginary part no peak, in the real part we have a peak. And this peak is much stronger than the peak that we would get uh, if we turn off excitonic effects completely. And um, so for germanium, uh, we have measured this and this can certainly be uh, done um, on, on other materials as well. So one way to achieve this screening is that you dope your material with very high carrier densities. And uh, the other way to um, create a very high density of excitons is with a high laser excitation. And this is an experiment by Lee, Fisref Letters, 1986. And here we have the absorption coefficient for different uh, laser intensities. And um, Curve number one is for a very low laser excitation and curve number eight is for a very high laser excitation. Unfortunately, there are some oscillations in the data. This is an experimental artifact that uh, ha there is no physics here. So we should, we should ignore that it becomes positive, negative, positive. We need to ignore these peaks. It just should just go like that. So for very high laser excitations, we have this sort of square root like onset of the excitonic absorption uh, with very high laser excitations. All excitons are ionized. We no longer see any excitonic enhancement. But as the, if, the, um, dense, if the density of excitons, if the laser excitation is lower, then the Sommerfeld enhancement becomes stronger and stronger and for the lowest excitation, we even have a hint of a little excitonic peak. So depending on the laser excitation, the absorption coefficient uh, changes uh, very significantly. 
And here's the reference for the book by Hauk and Koch that I mentioned earlier. So this is uh, excitons in um, gallium arsenide. This experiment was done at room temperature. So what happens if we do this experiment at low temperature? So here's another experiment, another example taken from uh, the book by Fox. Uh, the absorption coefficient versus photon energy for low excitation. Um, there is a very strong excitonic discrete peak in the absorption coefficient. But as I increase the um, electron hole density, um, this peak becomes weaker and also this peak becomes much broader. So the excitons, uh, the excitonic peaks get reduced and they get broadened as we increase the um, laser excitation energy. So I said before, laser excitation is one way to create uh, high densities of carriers. Another way to create high densities of carriers is with doping. And this example is from Fujiwara. Uh, this is zinc oxide doped with gallium with uh, doping densities that go from uh, 3 to the 19 to 6 times 10 to the 20. And case A is uh, 3 times 10 to the 19. So at this uh, moderate doping density, we see a nice step-like uh, Sommerfeld enhancement with an excitonic peak. As I increase the doping density, up to D, the uh, excitonic peak has uh, disappeared or at least has broadened significantly. And um, I'm definitely seeing uh, changes in the uh, excitonic absorption. I also see the Drew detail, which comes from the um, free carriers that are introduced by doping. I see a reduction in the peak in the real part of epsilon. I see a reduction in the refractive index. Uh, even though it's not clear whether the reduction in the refractive index is coming from a weakening of the excitonic effects or whether that's coming from the uh, increased strength of the Drude term. So one would have to model the imaginary part and the real part to see if there's indeed a uh, reduction that's only coming from the excitons. So, so far, uh, we've talked about uh, Vanier-Mott excitons. So, so far, we've talked about these Vanier-Mott excitons where the excitonic binding energy is very small and because the binding energy is small, because they are weakly bound, that's why the uh, radius of these excitons is rather large. So now I want to show you one or two examples of the Frankel excitons where the binding energy is on the order of electron volts and the um, Bohr radius is comparable to the lattice constant. So the first example for the um, Frankel exciton is in uh, alkali halides. So um, lithium fluoride has a band gap of 13 electron volts. So in lithium fluoride, the um, masses will be very large. The um, excitonic binding energy is two electron volts, two electron volts. So that's a huge excitonic binding energy in, in lithium fluoride. Uh, sodium chloride has a much smaller band gap of 8.8 .8 electron volts and therefore the excitonic binding energy is smaller in uh, sodium chloride than in lithium fluoride. It's only about 0.9 electron volts. So these alkali halides have very high band gaps, high effective masses, low uh, static dielectric constant and therefore the um, excitonic binding energies are huge. 
And another example, if we go to uh, rare gases like solid xenon, solid neon, solid argon, uh, in these uh, rare gas crystals, uh, we can also find um, very large excitonic binding energies. Um, so, so far, we've talked about excitonic effects here at the fundamental band gap of a material. But when we look, so this fundamental band gap of germanium is point and it is responsible for the um, onset of strong absorption um, at the E0 band gap in materials like germanium, gallium arsenide or other semiconductors. But um, when we talked about Van Hove singularities a couple of weeks ago, then we saw that we have these very strong features, E1 and E1 plus delta 1 in the dielectric function of germanium. And these features, we said, are Van Hove singularities, the joint density of states, uh, this, denom this term in the denominator goes to zero. That's why we have these strong peaks. And um, this, these peaks are coming from optical interband transitions that occur along the 111 direction of the Brillouin zone. Along the lambda direction, we have these two bands uh, the valence bands and the conduction bands are nearly parallel and therefore all transitions uh, occurring along this line will have the uh, same energy and that's why we get these very strong peaks. So we have classified these Van Hove singularities with these type of um, critical point structures, so we've expanded the critical point as a Taylor series with Taylor coefficients A in the quadratic term. The linear term was zero because, you know, the linear term is zero because the gradient vanishes. And then we've looked at how many of these parameters were zero or at least much smaller than the others. And um, depending on how many non-zero parameters A we have, we talked about one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional critical points. And then these Taylor coefficients can also be positive or negative. And the uh, superscript, I'm sorry, the subscript uh, lists the number of negative mass parameters. So in this language, the direct absorption for germanium or gallium arsenide is a three-dimensional critical point because all three of these are the same. And it is an M0 three-dimensional critical point because all of these A's are positive and none are negative. And we've talked about this morning about the excitonic effects affecting this particular critical point. But what about the other Van Hove singularities? Uh, are, should we worry about um, excitonic effects at the E1 critical point? So the E1 critical point is two-dimensional, and it is a mixture of a M0 and an M1 critical point. So that is one critical point is. So should we worry about excitonic effects here? And since this is a two-dimensional critical point, we have to solve a two-dimensional Schrodinger equation for the, for the Bohr model. So here in this region, the effective mass, the opt since the bands are parallel, this mass here along the 111 direction is very large and the mass for the bands out of the plane of this figure is very small. So this is the perpendicular mass for the curvature perpendicular to the 111 direction. 
this mass is small, this mass is very large, and we assume that this mass is infinite, and then we can separate this term in the Schrodinger equation, and then we're left with a two-dimensional Schrodinger equation, which only depends on x and y, no longer depends on z. So we can uh, use uh, cylindrical coordinates, we can separate the radial and polar variables, and for this two-dimensional Schrodinger equation, we get a similar, uh, for this two-dimensional uh, hydrogen problem, we get a similar Schrodinger equation as in the three-dimensional case, and the formulas for the excitonic binding energy and for uh, the formulas for the Bohr radius and for the excitonic binding energy, these formulas are still valid. However, the binding energy is now equal to the fundamental binding energy divided by n minus one-half squared. So remember, in the three-dimensional case, it was minus Rx over n squared. Now it is n minus one-half squared, and that means we get half-integral quantum numbers. So that's the two-dimensional uh, Schrodinger equation, and if we know the two-dimensional Schrodinger equation, if we, if we know how to solve this, now we can address the excitonic effects here at this E1 uh, saddle point, at this E1 critical point, and um, <coughs> the, the earliest paper in this uh, the, the first ones to think about this were Velitsky and Sack, and they were here from Prague, and some of you may recognize the names. Um, and uh, so they wrote a, a highly cited paper on how to discuss the, uh, how to write the dielectric function of the E1 critical points in semiconductors. Um, I'm showing you the results of Tangui, who used this uh, Schrodinger equation uh, and then uh, calculated the dielectric function uh, and uh, in a similar way as he did in the three-dimensional case, and there are similar parameters, and again, we have this digamma function in the uh, final result for the dielectric function of a two-dimensional critical point. Now, I wish I could show you some examples. Unfortunately, um, in, in Tangui's paper, there is no good example for um, a two-dimensional critical point for the E1 critical point of semiconductors. Um, but instead of instead of doing this Taylor expansion to deal with uh, critical points, of course, nowadays, one can also treat the complete band structure and then put everything on the computer and we can include excitonic effects uh, numerically. And um, there is this paper here from Hanke and Sham, 1980. And this is the silicon. This is the imaginary part of the dielectric function versus photon energy. And the round symbols, the round symbols show the, the result of the calculation if excitonic effects are not included. And what you see, there is no E1 peak. There's just this step here. So for the E1 peak of silicon, excitonic effects are very important. And in the diamonds, the excitonic effects were included. And if you do that, you include the excitonic effects you do get an E1 peak. Uh, so in the case of silicon, it is well known that there is a very strong enhancement of this E1 critical point for silicon. Now, when you look at strontium titanate, then you will see that in strontium titanate, you also have this uh, onset of the absorption uh, of the direct absorption at around 3.5 electron volts. And there's also arguments that in strontium titanate, uh, you also have a, a very strong excitonic contribution to the onset of the direct transitions. 
So um, one way of looking at uh, two-dimensional uh, problems is that we look at a two-dimensional transition in a three-dimensional semiconductor. But we can also look at excitons in quantum structures in very thin layers. So let's say we have gallium arsenide where this excitonic radius is 100 um, angstroms. But what if the gallium arsenide layer is only 50 angstroms thick and we have barriers of aluminum gallium arsenide on both sides? So if we look at this problem, then uh, we would call this a quantum well. And if instead of having a thin layer, we only have a one-dimensional structure, which would be a wire with a radius of 50 angstroms, which is smaller than the excitonic uh, radius. Uh, so that would be called a uh, quantum wire. And um, here is a calculation by Zimmermann from Berlin, 1995. And he starts with the three-dimensional case, and then he looks at the two-dimensional case and the one-dimensional case. And in the three-dimensional case, this is the... Um, fully screened absorption coefficient where the excitonic effects have turn, been turned off. And then there is a very strong enhancement of the, uh, the Sommerfeld enhancement from, continu from continuum absorption and a small excitonic peak. So this is for the case of a bulk exciton. In a quantum well where the width of the quantum well is 40% of the Bohr radius, there is a huge enhancement. So in a two-dimensional system, the excitonic enhancement is much stronger than in the one dimension, than in the three-dimensional case. If we go from two dimensions to one dimensions, one dimension, in the one-dimensional case for the quantum wire, the excitonic enhancement is even stronger than in the two-dimensional case. So as we reduce the dimensionality of our quantum structure, the Sommerfeld enhancement increases very significantly. And the way that we can understand this is that here we have these uh, this very, very large exciton in the three-dimensional case because the uh, exciton radius is so large, the overlap of the wave functions from the electron and the hole is very small, and therefore the uh, recombination coefficient is rather moderate. Now, if we confine the electron in a well or in a wire, then we squeeze the exciton, we did the excitonic radius becomes smaller because the exciton cannot spill out into the barriers and therefore we increase the overlap between the electron and the hole and therefore the recombination coefficients become larger. So um, we remember that in the two-dimensional case, the binding energy was written as Rx divided by 1 minus 1 half squared. So 1 half is the parameter that we need in the two-dimensional case. Um, zero is the parameter that we need for the um, three-dimensional case. So Zimmermann generalizes this formula where he writes, instead of writing n minus one half, he writes n minus q. And q equals one half is for the two dimensional case, q equals zero is for the three dimensional case. I just said that. But one half is really only the right parameter if the barriers of the quantum well are infinite but when we look at a gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide system, then the barriers are finite. So therefore, instead of using one half as the parameter, 
Zimmermann uses 0 0.4 as the parameter. So by using this Q as a fudge factor, uh, it is possible to take into account the finite uh, heights of the um, barriers. Yes? Is it possible to calculate it for quantum dots? Uh, Uh, so there's two questions, and the first question is, what is at what temperature was this calculated? And um, I don't remember whether this was done at zero Kelvin or at room temperature, but uh, here is the reference, so uh, please look it up. And uh, the other question was whether similar calculations exist for quantum dots, which are zero-dimensional objects, and the answer is yes, such calculations exist. I don't have an example with me right now, but I know that uh, many people have done such calculations. And uh, many people have looked for, um, uh, uh, for such enhancements for a very long time. And uh, let, me, let me say one more thing before I an uh, answer your question. So, this enhancement of the uh, uh, this enhancement of the excitonic absorption in low dimensional structures has very important practical purposes because if you want to build a semiconductor laser with a three dimensional material then your absorption coefficient is not very large and therefore your laser will not become very efficient on the other hand, if you go to a quantum well or to a quantum wire or to a quantum dot, then um, the enhancement will be uh, significant in low dimensional structures and therefore, at least in theory, um, lasers are much more efficient in low dimensional structures than in three dimensional structures. You had a question. So my son does his PhD thesis trying to build UV lasers. And with his UV lasers, he wants to um, uh, sterilize, purify the water in parts of the world where it is difficult to get clean water. So for that, you need a highly effective laser and so what I mean is a diode laser that, um, and I will show you an example, maybe not soon, but, but uh, at some point in the future, I will show you an example of a semiconductor laser. Probably I need to do emission first. But uh, I'm, I'm not talking about laser excitation here, but about a light emitting diode like the one you have in your CD player or, um, yeah, uh, uh, in, in traffic lights, so light emitting diodes and, and laser diodes and, and semiconductor lasers. So the question is, uh, this is a theory paper and uh, how does it compare with the experiments? And uh, the answer is that when I was doing my master's thesis, then people tried very hard to verify this experimentally. And the problem is that as you reduce the dimensionality, you increase the ratio of the surface to the interior of the material. If you have a three-dimensional crystal, then you, only need, you don't need to worry much about surfaces. If you have a quantum well, you need to worry about what happens at the interfaces. If you have a dot, then most of the dot is surface and very little of the dot is actually uh, pure material. So the, 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 the experimental difficulty in the beginning, in the 1980s and 90s was, how do you make, how do you make perfect surfaces? And uh, one of the people who worked on this was um, 
I forget his name, at, uh, um, it was uh, Louis Bruce at Columbia. And he realized that in order to make uh, quantum dots that emit light very efficiently, experimentally, you have to make a, co a, a core shell nanoparticle. So here you're used to having a gallium arsenide uh, well with aluminum gallium arsenide barriers. Now if, you, if you're able to make a gallium arsenide dot, that will not lace because the surface recombination, the non-radiative recombination at the surface will be so strong that it will not actually lace. So what you have to do is you have to surround this gallium arsenide nanoparticle, you have to surround this dot with a shell, with a barrier material where the um, energy, where the band gap is larger than for the core in the center. And once people realized this and were able to make these core shell nanoparticles, then they were able to verify that this is true experimentally. And um, I would like to show you some examples uh, when we talk more about nanostructures. Yes. Um, so the question is about the overlap of the wave functions. Yes, but in real space I'm and in space. In real space. If you localize in a real space, is it just on the localized in, in K space, in a reciprocal space, and after that, your electron will overlap in a reciprocal space is bigger? Is it correct? So the, the question is about uh, whether this overlap is in real space or in reciprocal space. Yes. So in reciprocal space, um, we are talking about excitons that were created by a direct transition. So the electron has a wave vector k and the hole has a wave vector minus k. The total wave vector of the exciton is zero. So therefore, I would argue that even in the three-dimensional case, the wave vector has a discrete value of zero. So the, in, uh, in reciprocal space, in K space, the confinement has no impact on the... In the three-dimensional case, k will be zero. And actually, if you confine it, then you have to deal with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, then actually it is less yes, confined yes, in, in, in yes, yes. it is that's less what, confined, yes. yes okay, so that, that was your question, good. Yes. So the answer is, uh, in, in low dimensional structures, you have Heisenberg uncertainty yes. principle, yes. so you confine it in real yes. space, but in K space, it is yes. less confined, yes. yeah? And now it is uh, quarter till 11, and I have probably another 20 slides. <laughs> so uh, this is probably a good time to stop and to say that um, uh, we will continue in one week from now. Right, Mareike? Uh, thank you for all your questions. Um, there is something that, yes. So. So today we talked about excitons and we talked about excitonic absorption primarily. Um, in the next lecture we will talk about luminescence and light emission and um, semiconductor lasers and things like that. And um, I received two emails about what would you like to see in the remaining lectures. 
And um, to summarize those emails, perhaps one email said, uh, I would like to know a little bit more about quantum structures, two-dimensional, one-dimensional, zero-dimensional materials. So there will be some material, some more material about quantum structures. And the other email perhaps is best described by saying, um, what about the role of defects? in materials, like uh, what about uh, titanium and sapphire? So if I take a perfect sapphire crystal and put a titanium atom in there, how will that affect the optical properties? Um, you can probably have an entire lecture series on defects, and um, therefore I don't know how much I can tell you about defects, and also because I'm not really an expert on defects. Um, I know more about pure materials. Uh, but I will try, uh, perhaps I will add some, some material about defects. But if you have any other requests or ideas about things that I should cover in the remaining two lectures, uh, then please send them to me and uh, I will do my best to find some material. So are there any other questions? Yes. I have always been too pessimistic with my assessment of technology. And if you would have asked, I started working for Motorola in 1997. And I was absolutely convinced that it would be impossible to have a phone which could take pictures or send emails. I was absolutely convinced. And that was only 20 years ago. That was only 20 years ago. So, um, so especially for the young people, you know, if, if, if you think something would be really cool, then you don't let anyone tell you that it's impossible, you just do it. So I will not pass that on to my son. I would rather let him live with the uh, hope that he will actually be able to make um, good wall plug efficiency uh, UV light emitting diodes. Uh, you had a question. same circular circumference. Uh, but uh, mobility of the hole is uh, much more or less than mobility of electron. Does it mean that the per electron hole is moving through the crystal? And if yes, uh, um, uh, there is discrepancy uh, with, uh, with uh, zero wave vector you have said. So um, the question is about the difference in mobility between electrons and holes and how does that affect the picture that I gave you for the uh, excitons, and um, let's remember how we had to deal with the Bohr model. 
So for the hydrogen atom, for the hydrogen atom, we have a proton and we have an electron. Or for positronium, we have a positron and we have an electron. So we have a two particle equation. And the first thing we do is that we separate this into a center of mass equation and a, uh, and a relative motion. So this is exactly what we do in this case as well, that we, um, the hole is much heavier than the electron because the hole has a lower mobility. So mobility is related to mass. So I get one equation for the center of mass, and that is a relatively trivial equation because it means that uh, the exciton needs to move with a constant velocity if there's no force, and then I can do a Galilei transformation, and then I can assume that the center of mass is at rest. And then um, here we're looking at the electron and hole moving in the same orbit around a uh, fixed point in space, and of course that is not correct, uh, but rather the correct picture would be that we uh, fix the center of mass and then the electron and the hole uh, will travel in orbits around the center of mass which will be different, but uh, this can be done relatively straightforward. Um, by a variable transformation by looking at this two body system. So this, yes, uh, uh, that is definitely true that this is uh, a simplified picture. Yes. Um, another question maybe related to this one a bit. Um, also, the, uh, the bo you spoke about broadening and the, is it due to the interaction with the lattice the broadening happens or there are uh, different other mechanisms as well? Um, so the question is about mechanisms for broadening. And the most, uh, the simplest case, uh, the simplest reason to have broadening is lifetime broadening. So if you look at Laudon's book, uh, Quantum Theory of Optics or whatever it's called, uh, the lifetime broadening is the first broadening parameter that he introduces. So anything which will destroy this exciton will give it a finite lifetime and any process to break up this, this exciton will uh, reduce its lifetime. So you mentioned electron phonon processes. So um, the electron binding energy is like one or two milli eV. A phonon energy is much larger, uh, maybe 30 or 40 milli eV for an optical phonon. So a phonon has more than enough energy to break up an exciton, and therefore electron hole scattering will be a significant contribution to the, to the reduced lifetime. But you can also think about um, other processes. If two excitons collide, for example, then uh, that could also reduce the lifetime. So lifetime broadening is the first contribution to the broadening. And lifetime broadening will typically give you a Lorentzian broadening. But if you think of this crystal being aluminum gallium arsenide or silicon germanium, then there is already this order built into the lattice. And uh, therefore, two excitons located in different positions of the crystal will see different uh, alloy fractions. And um, so you need to count, you need to count um, how many atoms are enclosed in the volume of the exciton and uh, for a given contribution, uh, you need to do Poisson statistics. What is the distribution of, um, what is the distribution that I will get for the uh, alloy fraction? The smaller the excitonic radius, the larger these uh, differences. And, um, 
This is an inhomogeneous broadening because different excitons will see different parts of the crystal with their different alloy fraction, and that will typically give you a Gaussian broadening. Um, you can have strain fields, you can have dislocations, you can have uh, surfaces, you can have many other sorts of defects that can also contribute to uh, broadenings, but in the, uh, for a pure crystal, electron phonon scattering of the exciton is one of the most significant contributions to the uh, broadening. Okay. Uh, what is the typical lifetime? Is it compared to the, uh, what is it, the time of travel on the orbit, or it's much longer? Oh, that I can't answer. So I don't know, but I haven't calculated the time of an orbit. And it's a quantum mechanical object, so what does that even mean? Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, the electron phonon scattering time is on the order of 100 femtoseconds. So it's very, very small. And uh, perhaps it's almost 11 o'clock, perhaps we should end now. So uh, thank you very much, and I will see you again on Friday, next Friday. Thank you. Thank you.